Hello, everyone. Welcome to this summer session of Making Sense of the Digital Society, hosted by the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the Bundeszentrale für, Bundes, uh, für politische Bildung, and of course the HIC, the Humboldt Institute for Internet und Gesellschaft or Society in English. This hybrid event still, as you see it, we all wearing masks, we're all tested with a small team here on site in Berlin. Uh, in Sergeant, masked when not on stage, it ain't over till it's over. But for now we're starting because probably some of you, at least those of you who watch this show live here, probably want to watch the European Championship tonight starting at nine. You will be safe, I can say you that much. Um, the series in its fourth year now has stressed European positions in the digital transformation. It often has been a transatlantic conversation, partly due um, you know, to the fact that U.S. or British University are renowned speakers uh, are or had been involved in. The geopolitical perspective shifts tonight to China, to digital governance between control and convenience. I've heard to the outline of the next more or less 80 minutes, the regulars of you uh, know how this is going to go about. There's going to be the talk of our guest, uh, who I'm going to introduce to you in a minute, maybe about 30, 35, 40 minutes. We'll see about that. And then we'll have a conversation on stage, one-on-one, -on -one, just the two of us for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And then it's your turn. Actually, it's your turn now because there are two participatory tools um, that you can, where you can ask your questions. It's Twitter and it's Slido. The hashtag is Digital Society. Christian Graufogel, um, who is organizing this event, who has organized this event all these years, uh, we've been on the series now, will be your advocate. He will read out uh, the question we'll have time for after the conversation. Do ask questions, please. Now is the time to learn something about China or from China. Our guest is professor of Chinese politics at the Freie Universität here in Berlin. She studied international relations and political science at LSE, London School of Economics, at Johns Hopkins, at Oxford, and in Hong Kong. Prior to her chair at the Freie Universität, she was professor of governance of energy and infrastructure at the Hertie School here in Berlin, too. She also gained a lot of experience as a strategic management consultant for McKinsey, for example, for the World Bank or the OECD. Needless to say, her research has appeared in numerous social science journals. Research, by the way, that includes a lot of field work. She actually looked at how Chinese people in certain communalities view the social credit system we hear so much about here in Europe. Sometimes it's quite foggy for most of us what this actually means. She did some concrete research in China, or how people view you know, facial recognition technologies and such. Her talk tonight draws from her current grant by the ERC, the European Research Council from 2020 to 25. Her project explores how digital technologies are integrated into local decision-making and governance structures in China. The talk is titled Big Data Dreams and Local Reality in China. I'm really looking forward to know more, especially since this, for many, like me, rather foggy field, China, technology, superpower, is going to clear up quite a bit. Here she is, so pleased to introduce you to Genia Kostka. Thank you, Toby, for this very kind introduction. And I'm very honored to be here today at this great lecture series. So the topic I will talk about is big data dreams and local reality in China. Cities everywhere adopt digital technologies into local policy processes. And here, China is really at the forefront. It's interesting because half of all the smart cities in the world are in China. And China has started more than 4,000 local digital technologies. So it's a natural laboratory where we can learn about the risks and the benefits. So we see a lot of success cases in China. In Beijing, citizens can use administrative online services and apps. In Shenzhen, for example, the local government is merging environmental data and has set up an early 
warning system uh, to manage uh, and find severe smoke warnings. And in Hangzhou, for example, the local government has a city brain project uh, which uses big data anal analytics for traffic management. All these projects are branded by the government as, a, as digital tools that they help to solve China's urban governance problems. But at the same time, the very technologies that help to address these problems can also be used by the government to enhance the state capacities for surveillance and also oppression of political opponents, like it's happening in Xinjiang. So let's have a look at this. And today I want to make one point. And the point I want to make is that China's digital transformation is very much a top-down mandated digitalization. So the state keeps a very tight grip on this process. And in order to implement digital technologies uh, uh, dig or transformation, the state is using existing command and control structures. And such structures have been very effective in the past. For example, to um, implement one-child policy um, targets, or also to address China's emerging environmental crisis. But how is, is it playing out for digital matters? And here we will see that Chinese is using almost coercive elements when implementing digital targets, and that can result in undesirable um, consequences. So maybe we will see that the local reality is not always as shiny as the media sometimes portrays it. So let's have a look. So all over China, local governments are starting digital initiatives. Here you see one province, Zhejiang. It's a very rich uh, coastal province, uh, home to 65 million people, so very large. And it's also home of the private company Alibaba. So around 2015, 2016, um, the capital city where Alibaba is based, Hangzhou, started to first experiment with digital initiatives. And as we can see in the last five years, all the neighboring municipalities also then started to copy and adopt and have their own digital initiatives. So at the moment in 2021, each municipality has about 20 to 50 digital projects and initiatives. So how does this work? And of course, the local government state can't do it on their own. And a very interesting new dynamic emerges where they really work with private companies like Alibaba. For example, in total, more than 350 local governments contracts have been signed with Tencent, Alibaba, and Huawei to build this smart city infrastructure. And this really creates a very interesting uh, dynamic uh, relationship full of conflicts, conflicts over data ownership, data sharing, and data privacy practice. So let's have a look at both of the sides. So the national and the local governments, they want to keep ownership and control over data. They don't want to get these private companies to get too big. And they want to make sure that these companies follow communist party objectives. And in order to achieve this, of course, they can't own these private companies. But they have started to use other methods. One very important method is that they have started to implant party units within the private enterprises. So large private enterprises usually need to have a party unit in there. And these party officials actually steer also HR process processes in private companies. So it's a very clever way to make sure that the party knows what's happening in these companies. Private companies, on the other hand, have been becoming really increasingly powerful. We've seen how Jack Ma was really uh, stopped becoming more powerful in the last year. And these companies are so confident that sometimes they actually have started to delay sharing their data with the government. And they often say, well, we don't share the data because there's no regulation. So there's an increasingly a confidence that these private tech companies have in China. And of course, the state has responded this year. So now we have seen two important new laws coming out uh, that try to really push for regulation that are in the interest of the state. The first is the China new data security law, which is looking at 
what data is important in terms of state security. And then there's a personal information protection law that deals more in ensuring privacy of citizens. But both laws actually all together helped the government to get greater digital control over the private sector. So let's have a look then. So the government keeps control of the private sector, but how is China managing to really push so, in such speed these digital initiatives? And here really important are existing structures. And there are two structures that are really important or practices. One is planning. China always has been a planned economy. And it uses these kind of plans for really as state signals. So we've seen in 2013 um, a smart city initiative plan. We see big data development plans. And the recent 14th um, five-year plan also stresses that data is a really strategic resource for China. And these are plans at the national level, but local officials study these plans and then copy them and integrate them in their own local plans. So it's actually, they have a very important meaning. They're signaling to all the local and party cadres and officials where China is heading. The second um, common um, tool that China always has been using since reform and opening up is simply using pilots and policy experimentation. So, for example, in 2013, we have seen smart city pilots starting. There's a first batch, a second batch. Um, this year, we have seen um, pilots for intelligent connected vehicles. So six municipalities are now currently testing out how to use intelligent vehicles um, for smart cities. And these policies are really, again, used to see what is working, what is not working, and then they are scaled up um, uh, as a national policy. So next to the plans and the pilots, China has also, and I think that's actually new, created a new big data bureaucracy. So that bureaucracy really adds muscles to uh, the general uh, digital push. So almost uh, two thirds of, or actually 23 provinces have created provincial big data administrative bureaus. And these bureaus are actually in charge of driving these pilots. They are getting funding from various from sources and they really plan and steer these local implementation um, mandates. So that's really um, um, how China is uh, starting to give this push, but still, how do you actually steer so many provinces? I mean, more than 30 provinces, and they're the size of Germany, and they all have different interests. How do you steer and make sure they follow what Beijing wants? And I think here I just want to talk about China's political structure, because I think it's very important to understand this. And China is actually what we call a decentralized authoritarianism. So what we mean is it has some centralized and some decentralized elements. China is centralized in terms of how um, local officials get appointed. So in Beijing, they can appoint the party secretaries and the mayors at the provinces. So they, they can really keep tight control who is actually promoted or not. At the same time, you have a very decentralized administrative and economic structure. So the provinces have 30 provinces have a lot of freedom in terms of how they implement the plans. And that gives them a, a lot of own choices of how to respond to these state signals. So let's have a look. And I think what's important here is to understand that the local officials respond to these um, plans and to these pilots because there's a target system. So China, Beijing sets digital targets, and then they trickle down from Beijing to the provinces to the municipalities. And each target, uh, each official gets such a target, and annually they get basically um, reviewed whether they made the specific target or not. So there's a fierce competition to make sure you achieve the target. And the competition is also there because there are very few slots upwards, but many carters who try to get these slots. So in terms of the digital transformation, so the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology uh, set up, for example, targets for online public service quality. That's just one example. 
And then, for example, Zhejiang, the province we looked at earlier, then a CARDA gets a target um, and has to achieve 23 points. Uh, 10 points for innovation, 10, 8 points for digital transformation, and uh, 5 points for standardization. And then there's an annual review. And if you don't make these targets, you might not get promoted. And you might even be sent to a very remote rural area. So they have strong incentives um, to meet those. Um, let's look at what it does. So given that there is a st strong target system, how does it play out at, uh, in reality? So here on the map, you see all uh, the digital government platforms that have emerged over the last two years. So every province now has a digital government platform. And these provincial platforms have also been linked with a national uh, platform. So here you can see, let's take the one province we've been talking about, Zhejiang. So this one province has also an app, um, and it's an app where you basically can, it's called a one-stop public service platform. So it doesn't matter whether you want to do social security, get your driver license, taxation, you can use one app and do all uh, government um, uh, things. So the government promotes it. You don't need to go to any government facility anymore because the app exists. And over 100 uh, administrative tasks you can do now via the app. And 53 million people in that province have downloaded it. It sounds pretty impressive, and it is, right? I mean, in Germany, uh, I wish some of these online uh, tasks would be available. It has improved during the COVID uh, pandemic, but still, I think there's a lot of uh, upward potential here. But in, in the province in Zhejiang, so how did they manage to implement it so fast? And of course, targets play a role. So local officials, again, got a target to, uh, to make sure enough people download this app. And I call it actually, it was a bit of a forced digitalization because it's not only that the party mayor, uh, secretary and the party mayor got these targets, but these targets got uh, passed down to a lot of bureaus in that province. So even hospi hospital doctors and nurses got these targets, or people who worked for housing and rural urban development. And the typical target was like that you had to convince 50 people to download the app per month. And here, a lot of officials actually online complained about it. Like many nurses or people in the hospital were saying like, uh, we are already fighting the COVID pandemic. I mean, why are we now forced to also be sales marketing people? And others said this is like forced promotion. Um, so you can see a little bit, um, it's working, it's working fast, but it has a little bit of a forced element to it. And as you can see here also, these, uh, this online app gets very mixed ratings. So we looked um, at different app providers, Apple and others. And as you can see, on average, I mean, these, uh, this app got a rating of 2.8, which is not very a lot. And this is because when we study all these online comments, there are a lot of interface problems, technical problems, slow speed. So it's not always working as well. And it's not just in that one province. We checked other provinces and a lot of complaints exist. So some, for example, a journalist was saying, oh, some of these apps are zombie apps. They're major technical problems. Others were like rating uh, the app with a zero. Even one report said there was only a scenery picture and nothing else. And I think the comment by an app developer is very interesting. Um, the app developer complains that Government officials seem to care more um, to have something to show to the upper level government, but they don't care so much about the functions of the app. I mean, this is of course just one side of the picture, but there is a little bit of what I call a digital implementation gap. So things are not always working uh, as well, and I mean, this is probably also globally the case. But next to this political um, forced structures, China has also created a lot of financial incentives for local governments. So especially when we look at the provincial budget, a lot of money has been put to these new big data development funds. 
And also, I've, we see a lot of joint investments, and I think that's very interesting. A lot of limited companies have been created. Um, so that are companies where private or state-owned tech firms have ownership, and sometimes also the government, the state fund, or local governments. So they together then are in charge of operating and managing this data. So political and financial incentives. So now, having looked at the broader political structure, let's look at one case. Um, and let's look a little bit more at this digital implementation gap. So what are the hurdles? And now I want to turn to Shenzhen. That's a city next to Hong Kong. It's home to 12 million people. It's actually where the private company Tencent and Huawei are. And it started in 2010, its first smart city pilot. And in 2018, it came up with this very fancy, comprehensive smart city plan. I mean, you can see here the plan is very detailed. It has a city big data center. It has a lot of smart city sensor grid system and a smart city coordination management system. So a very detailed plan. And so we went there and tried to find out how is it actually looking in reality. And of course, surprise, surprise, it's not always as easy to really uh, push for real digital smart city implementation. And one, on the one hand, we see technical hurdles. I mean, this is also to be expected. A typical problem is with regards to standardization. And here, we really have data quantity and quality issues. Um, so uh, officials said also, like, you have garbage in, garbage out. So some data that exist, you can't really use. Also, you have integration issues. issues. So the data is often very heterogeneous, and uh, the standards are not compatible. And so it's very hard sometimes to move from data collection to actually using this data for analysis. And then there's also missing know-how sometimes by the state actors. But next to the technical hurdles, actually, it was really also the political hurdles that slowed down the smart city implementation. And when I talk about political hurdles, I mean really local data politics, and they're really different vested interests within the city administration. So they're unclear data authorization rules between the bureaucracies. There are also disputes, uh, disputes. I mean, bureaus realize that having, uh, holding and controlling data these days means power. So they're not willing to give up data. Yet the entire process is trying to centralize data more to the city center. And some bureaus would be sidelined. Um, so we see this concentration of data, but of course this is not a smooth process. So overall, uh, looking at it, we see um, stagnation of these projects. Um, they often are stuck in what we call phase one. So it's, there's a big data lake available, lots of collected raw data, but it's a little bit unclear how to use it effectively for decision making and prediction. So political hurdles are important as much as technical hurdles. So now, Summing a little bit up the structure what we just talked about, China's decentralized authoritarian structures. This creates actually some advantages uh, for digital transformation and also some disadvantages. In terms of advantages, I mean, we've seen it's a very speedy process. We also see a lot of flexibility for local governments in terms of how to implement these targets and these plans. And there is also room for trial and error. So these pilots allow for um, checking what is acceptable and what's not. For example, one case here is in one um, city, Suzhou in Jiangsu, the government last year tried to create a new social credit system, really tracking actually the behavior of people. But the local citizens really didn't approve it and they complained about the social, on it in social media. And the local government had then actually no choice but to respond. And after three days of launching the pilot, the local government then stopped the social credit pilot. So that shows it also gives some trial and error without losing too much face because it's just a pilot and you can quickly adjust it. 
but the system also offers many disadvantages. We talked about the targets, and it's often these targets are like one size fits all. So we looked at the digital platforms, and having these do uh, download app targets for nurses, it's not desirable. But there's so much pressure to have local showcase projects that often it comes to these kind of last minute uh, pressured responses. There's also an overextension of financial resources and overcapacity, so a lot of provinces uh, starting to invest in very similar things. And uh, talking about the pilots, if you have many different pilots across China, there is an issue also eventually with how to scale up these pilots uh, to the national level. So these are really uh, in terms of the government. I just want to use the last minutes to talk a little bit what citizens think because that's a lot um, uh, controversy and there's also some maybe misunderstanding. So often um, people are surprised when they hear that citizens are approving. And actually I conducted three surveys on facial recognition technology, social credit, and also contact tracing apps over the last years. And all these surveys with over thousands of Chinese online uh, citizens, um, they showed that there's approval rates uh, between 60 and 80 percent. And this is higher than what we find in Germany and the US. But despite this approval, it is not, and I think that's important, that it's not that Chinese citizens don't care about privacy. They actually do. All the surveys again and again shows us. They also worry about transparency and fairness. They also complain they don't want the system abused by local governments. But somehow there's still some technic optimism. I find this very fascinating. Um, and when you talk to citizens, I always wonder why is it that they're so more optimistic than let's say we are in Germany? Is it because the system is more advanced already there? So you see the benefits more clearly? Or is it simply that the risks are less visible? I mean, digital surveillance is not as visible as maybe real uh, in-person surveillance. Or is it because also the risks are not discussed in state-controlled media? And for sure, I mean, our findings also show um, that the media only sh uh, shows a very positive um, picture on these matters. Like we analyzed um, uh, 600 articles on the social credit system, and only 4% uh, were actually negative or pointed out uh, risks. So yes, I think that's possibly also one part of the answer. So. Um, given this, it's, uh, and I mentioned the uh, example of Suzhou, it's not also that the Chinese citizens are unwilling to approve all of digital technologies. We just so, uh, saw that there's protest on social media when it gets too much. We also saw in Hangzhou when uh, the government proposed to uh, continue using the contact tracing app after COVID-19 is over, there was a lot of local protests and then the government had to change its plan and say, okay, we are not continue using this tracing app. So there is a, a red line also for citizens uh, and if it's too much, they also will find social media means and other ways to um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, express their views. So on this note, let me just find, uh, finish with some humor. I mean, you find what I, uh, the public actually shares a lot of online humor when things are not working so well with AI and uh, tech, digital technologies. So here you see, um, for example, there's an IE-based camera that looks for jaywalkers, and you can see there's a bus with a picture, and by accident, the camera uh, identifies a picture from the advertisement as a jaywalker. And online, you find lots of these examples where citizens have these jokes and humors. Another example is here from a school where sc many schools use facial recognition cameras, and the uh, facial recognition camera identified a stranger. And you can see here it's a dog, um, very dangerous. Yeah. So, um, it's uh, interesting, there is uh, a lot that doesn't go well, but there seems to also be some kind of online humor who uh, deals with this. So let's conclude. So um, what I think is really important to see is that China moves very quickly. It uses existing command and control structures to push digital initiatives um, through its uh, structures. 
and it also has some coercive element. And this coercion is really uh, resulting in some undesirable consequences. So maybe local reality is not always as shiny as maybe sometimes the media portrays. We have political hurdles, like we've seen in Shenzhen, where bureaucratic fragmentation puts sand in the wheels. And overall, the party state is increasingly drawing regulation and guidelines to gain leverage over the private sector. But again, that is a very complicated dynamic and is, might also stifle some innovation. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kenya, for this talk, and thank you for uh, putting up with the uh, sound problems uh, we've had. I'm sorry about that. That's never happened before, but uh, I don't know exactly what happened. But we had a problem. We had to start again. For uh, those of you who watch this session on recording, you probably will hardly notice. But for those of you who watched live, I uh, apologize uh, for this. Uh, just at the very end uh, of your talk, Kenya, I was wondering uh, about the humorous part. Uh, do people actually play with this? How well does facial recognition work with masks everybody wore because of COVID? I mean, even masks that are maybe maybe a mask with a dog on or whatever, can you, can you do something to distort or to uh, bypass facial recognition with masks? Has that happened? I mean, actually, there are many technologies now uh, in Chinese, like um, uh, Sense, Sense Time and other companies, they already claim that they have, I think, 80 or 90 percent, they can identify people with masks. Oh, really? So wow. it's, the technology is moving so fast uh -huh. that uh, this is no longer a problem. Mm. But there are many other uh, jokes. I mean, just a personal anecdote. I have two sisters who are identical twins, and they used to unlock their smartphones. So, I mean, there are many, uh, you know, ways where these uh, facial recognition technologies still have some errors. Yeah. And, I mean, we also know there are some discrimi discriminatory elements yeah. in terms of uh, people of color are sometimes uh, easier, uh, like, picked out as not identifiable. Yeah. Um, so, there are some... Uh, issues with the technology even today. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, I'd like to start with a kind of a broad question and then delve deeper uh, in, into your talk. And I was wondering because you also talked about, you know, bad practices or things that do not work that well in uh, Chinese smart cities. Uh, I want to ask you, what makes a smart city smart in China? Since there's over half of all the cities that are called smart cities in the world are in China, 500 of a thousand, you said in your talk, what makes it smart? Is a smart city smart when it posts or when it works with an app that uh, just puts up a scenic picture, as you said uh, in your talk, or just one picture? What makes it smart, actually? Is there a definition that you go by? Um, this is a question that we all discuss, and I mean, I personally don't love this word smart city because uh -huh. it's everything and nothing. So it's, yes. Um, I brought it up, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it's, it's a good question. And uh, I mean, this reference comes from a Deloitte report, and I think yeah. consultants are much more willing to put a label on it. Mm -hmm. And so they identified certain sectors, and as, as long as uh, a city has a couple of sectors where they have some digital initiatives, they can be classified as smart. Yeah. But there are many, I think out of the 500 <coughs> cities that are smart cities in China, I think there are maybe uh, 200 that I would classify as smart city. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many cities that I would say they're trying very hard, but I wouldn't say they're a smart city. I found it very interesting um, when you talked about Shenzhen, the big data lake. All the data that, uh, you know, that's being collected, but uh, that's not being worked with or is not analyzed or doesn't lead anywhere or uh, it doesn't help anybody, so to speak. It's just there. I mean, it's what we've seen with um, Western surveillance agencies also with the NSA, the collect all approach uh, that people like Edward Snowden uh, criticized uh, for so long, something that didn't work, something that didn't even prevent 9-11, uh, he said back at the time. Um, is that a technical problem in Shenzhen or is it a political problem? Does it have to do with the difference between centralization and decentralization you talked about? Or is it just a bug? Is it just a technical problem that can be fixed that this, you know, collect all approach to big data lake, as you called it, does actually lead anywhere? 
Um, so I think data is a very complicated topic in China. So China used to be notoriously very bad with data. So when I would go on field work and I was like, I need this data, they would always say, I don't have. Um, it would be like, Mayo, I don't have it. Um, it was like almost... Uh, a surprise if a government official would fill out or give me a table with some data points. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was also, um, it was working because uh, government decisions were not based on data. But this is changing now. So traditionally, when you would go to a bureau, you would really find conflicting data. And as an outsider, you would like, oh, this doesn't make sense. But um, it wasn't really important to have the best quality data. Um, but now that actually China is moving to a data-driven decision-making process, um, they are trying to fix this, and it's a long way. So let's take environmental data. Um, so initially, um, there was very poor data. Now they slowly used more um, like real-time monitoring. They used also GPS for environmental data. And all these technologies help to actually improve the data. Um, but that's still... Um, is a slow process because initially there was also some manipulation of data because certain local government bureaus didn't want to um, have certain bad news shared with the upper governments. Um, so I think this is a, a slow um, and uh, hard route that China is taking because the, star the starting base was very low. Um, and now they use the technologies, but you have to fill the, uh, you have to fill it with data. And let's say Shenzhen, as you talked about, it's very, for example, the local government realized we don't really have good populations data to start with. Hmm. We actually don't know who lives in our city because we have such a migrant population. Mm -hmm. And so all these new data initiatives take a lot longer than initially um, was planned. Who decides what kind of data is being collected? in a city like Shenzhen. Is this a centralized approach or is it decentralized? I didn't get that quite. Um, so, I mean, the, there are central programs and yeah. that's uh, definitely where the national government says, this is the data we need okay, and yeah. you need to collect. But then there's also, again, local programs that mm -hmm. sometimes even collect more data than the center to yeah. also impress their upper government. Yeah, okay. And so it can be both and um, it decides the, the state and the party. Yeah. I found very interesting, of course, in a comparative approach, uh, um, also when you talked about so-called public-private partnerships, we would call it in the West. You uh, didn't use that term, mm -hmm. as I recall, but that's what it reminded me of when you said that, you know, those, uh, all those big companies we know here, Tencent, and Alibaba and so forth have state officials in their boards or, uh, uh, you know, whoever runs the company uh, at this time. Well, we do have certain examples that work in a somewhat similar way. My question would be like, when we talk about digital traffic, we can talk about actual traffic, about some railway uh, companies in Europe that are still somehow state affiliated, where the state has a certain say uh, in it, so to speak. Um, how does this play out? I mean, what's the role of state officials in a huge firm like Tencent and uh, uh, Alibaba? Guess, can this be compared to what I've just said about European railway companies or is it a totally different approach? I think it's a very different setting. Mm -hmm. I think to be uh, in a, a business entrepreneur in China is still very risky. Mm. I mean, this was in the 80s uh, forbidden element and so even today it is very clear who uh, sets the rules and that is not there no i mean everyone operates in some gray areas and as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur you always know that if you let's say talk to the wrong fraction with the local government fraction you might in, within a half a year actually be charged for financial crimes and this happens all the time so mm -hmm. two years ago a uh, CEO of a big insurance company was uh, put in prison for 18 years for financial crimes and often these are crimes that I mean every private entrepreneur almost by can't but has to operate in a gray zone and uh, so you really have a much stronger dependence on the goodwill of certain people so it's a much riskier business and, I mean, we've seen it with Jack Ma, uh, he, the comp he was allowed to do what he wanted to do, but as soon as he attacked the banking state monopoly, um, mm. he really was uh, 
basically uh, put into his place and uh, that has uh, i mean also dramatic um, influence uh, or like for his own company yeah one very interesting example you you quoted in that uh, um, field there is the uh, Celiban app, uh, of course. Germans, I think, many Germans would dream um, of such an app combining so many public services in a bundle, like in one app. I mean, if they w if they do function, we don't know. Uh, you know, without having to show up in person, get appointments, wait in line forever, fill out overly complex forms. Um, that's a problem all over Germany, especially in Berlin, <laughs> where we are now. Um, but the downside, of course, is all this data is centralized in this example, uh, if I'm correct, right, with the uh, Celibon app. Is it also hackable? Are people afraid of... I mean, that's the... That's the gateway to being hacked, right? If data is centralized, that's the most dangerous thing you can do. And that's why we talk so much about decentralized networks uh, uh, and uh, technology and blockchain and so forth to make it safer. If data is centralized now uh, in, in China, is, is this an issue? I mean, people worry about this, and mm. there are some examples where it happened. So even China can't, uh, you know, like um, say for abuse of these data hackers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this, will, this is and will be an issue. Um, but I think there's more. Co I mean, I think historically Germans we are very aware what can go wrong if certain things happen with the wrong people are leading the country. Um, I think this kind of historical fear of that one person or one party gets too much power, um, you don't necessarily have this in China. And I I'm always surprised people just say, oh, these private companies and the party, they have anyway any data from me anyway. Um, so they ha have less fear of this um, abuse of data. Um, it doesn't mean they don't have it. I mean, th people do worry about it. Um, but it's uh, maybe also historically a little bit a different attitude towards it. But the convenience is extremely high. If such an app, a Celibon uh, app, actually works well, uh, this would be a major breakthrough uh, for any European country. No European country is nowhere near, right? Uh, this kind of public convenience, so to speak. And of course, we know about convenience when we talk about other private online services like platforms we've been talking about so much uh, in the last years and keep on talking a lot about where convenience is extremely high too in social media, uh, in spite of the fact that pretty much everybody knows what's happening, uh, you know, with data mining and so forth. I mean, it's not, this is not a secret anymore uh, for the public, but the convenience outweighs the dangers, apparently, for billions of users all over the world. Uh, so what's the relation there in, uh, in China between convenience, which is undoubtedly very high of such an app, uh, and the control aspect? Yes, I mean, let me quote this study we did on facial recognition technology, mm. and we studied exactly this control um, versus security versus convenience. And actually, we did find that in China, convenience and efficiency is the uh, main reason why people approve of facial recognition. Mm -hmm. But in Germany, uh, for example, there really is more um, worries about control and surveillance and privacy. Uh, data privacy. So I think it's, um, yeah, so I wouldn't say that uh, we can compare the importance of convenience. In, um, I think in China, there's a much more pragmatic approach to it. There is maybe because uh, they already see some benefits. They, the preference for convenience is much higher in China than in the US or in Germany on these matters. We see it also with a health Co uh, health um, co contact tracing app. Mm -hmm. So the health code in China is actually using a lot more data. You yeah. uh, give your ID, it's stored on a centralized server um, versus in Germany or in, in the US, there um, it's a very decentralized uh, system. Um, and I think that is also because you could not actually implement the Chinese healthcare app in Germany because people sure. just would not agree to it and rightly so because uh, if you store it on a centralized server, um, you, I mean, in China, um, the private companies share that data with the police and that is personal data. It's about traveling, it's about uh, healthcare information and uh, I, think, uh, I, I think that 
German or also the US approach of protecting individuals' privacy is uh, also a response that fits to Europe. It wouldn't work to have the Chinese health code. Do you see that complex shifting a little bit or has been shifting a little bit during the pandemic where a lot of people, even in Germany, said, well, well, it's not really a tracing app, but the, the COVID app uh, a lot of people have mm -hmm. used and still are using now uh, for their vaccination uh, mm -hmm. certificates and so forth. They'll be using, um, you know, all the data security there has been advocated by private firms, uh, by big platform firms and so forth, not by the state, so to speak. And many people in, uh, I think, in the public discourse actually wished for uh, less data security in order to make the app better. If that was true, if that was the right incentive, that's another question, but that surprised me actually in the last year. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that the German app was not very efficient. Um, yeah. I mean, just an example, half of my kindergarten, the kita of my kids, half of them had COVID, and my app showed me no warning that I was in contact with anyone with COVID. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the app is not very working well because it's also not mandatory. In China, it's mm -hmm. mandatory. You can't enter public spaces yeah. um, if you not have this health code app and the code. So... I think that's uh, very diff different. But just to one point, it is uh, we do see surveys that show that during the pandemic in the US and in Germany, privacy um, um, concerns have been uh, declined a bit. So people are less worried about it. So I think that is one thing we see during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Let's look what happened with our hashtag, Digital Society, if there are questions to you. I still have a couple left for the very end, but uh, I hope you're still out there participating in this discussion. Christian, what can you tell us? What questions do you have for Genia Kostka? Yes, we have uh, a couple of questions. Um, so some have been already answered during your conversation. But um, there was one question about the centralized infrastructure. So the question asks, are the different regional governmental platforms are centrally steered? In Germany, sometimes we face the problem that every regional government is trying to set up their own structure. Central open source infrastructure would help or not? Yes. I think, I mean, this is also China is, is struggling with this. So it's uh, given that we have these different local pilots, it doesn't mean that they all have the same um, um, system. And so that is what I meant is there will be problems with scaling up. So um, just because each province has now its own app, they all work differently. They focus on different things. We also see that this is what we often talk about, the social credit system. I mean, there's not one national system, but there are like 40, uh, more than 40 different pilots, but they're very different, and uh, it's impossible to then scale them up, and you would have to pick, and I think that is also what Beijing is looking at, how are they different types of pilots working, but there will be issues of actually making it a central approach to this, and that explains why we do, it takes a long time to have then a central system, or impossible. So, um, you already talked a bit about the different acceptance of technologies in uh, Germany and China during the Corona crisis, um, but there's a more general question um, where does the red line of the Chinese people lie with the acceptance of technology? Maybe you can um, mention that a bit again. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to. So, I mean, there are very different groups. I mean, there's not one opinion. So, it, it's, I'm very careful always to uh, look at different, um, um, like, different segments of the society, young, old, um, more educated, and generally, um, I thought it was very interesting that acceptance was a bit higher, for example, for the social credit system of the more well-off and more educated people, and that was very surprising to me. But then uh, looking deeper and uh, doing interviews, it became very also clear that the people just didn't see this as an instrument for control. There are very different other instruments for which the 
party or the public security bureau, bureau is using to surveil or um, control political opponents. For m most Chinese people, first of all, it's a very abstract thing, the social credit system. They're not very much affected by it. And when they think about it, they see it more as a, a very boring almost tool to enforce uh, laws and regulations that are not otherwise enforced. Um, and so the better and well-educated citizens just saw the social credit system just as an um, um, yeah, uh, enforcement tool to increase, again, trust in society because there's a lot of internet scamming and so on. Um, so I think that's, uh, again, I just point this out because sometimes I feel, uh, we always feel, why don't they fear it? But sometimes it's just a very different frame of um, seeing these technologies. It's not seen as a frame for control, but really more as, let's say, close regulatory and institutional gaps or facial recognition is seen to improve security, even though, of course, we know it's actually not lowering crime rates, it's just helping much more, more with identifying criminals. But still, it's a different um, yeah, frame we often see. Um, but there is a red line, and I think the red line is really when it's um, if when it becomes unfair. And I think that is really, uh, I mentioned the case, for example, social credit um, system. If citizens feel like, let's say, corrupt local officials are getting away with murder, yeah, let's say they have a traffic accident, but they still can buy themselves a good social credit score. I think that's where people really get upset, unfairness or intransparency of these technologies. And then we see very quickly also uh, protest and unhappiness in social media. So that's, and the government is also aware of it. So it's a fine line. Just one quick uh, question to that. When you talk about social credit uh, system, um, what I think many people in the West don't know about is that it also applies to uh, fields like pollution control, of uh, controlling big factories, you know, the output, what kind of uh, CO2 they're uh, ejecting and so forth. I think that would be something to sell this kind of system <laughs> in many Western countries by now. Uh, is this part of a, a PR thing in, in China, actually, that uh, the credit system is sold also with those kind of measures, controlling firms and their pollution? I mean, if you look at the social credit system, it actually almost always applies to companies. There are very few of these pilots who mm. target individuals. Mm. And the reason is simply it's impossible for many cities like the big ones we talked about with millions of citizens. The local government does not have the capacity to yeah. really come up with an efficient system. And so what they have done is really just target businesses, make sure they, abide, they follow, like, let's say, food um, regulations, they follow pollution control. But in my view, this is the second best system. The better system would be have efficient laws, efficient sure. legal um, system, uh, have independent judges who are not corrupt. So I'm just not very impressed with this entire social credit system. And I wonder, I mean, there's no national system yet. And maybe we are over talking it maybe the pilots will show it's actually you know not really increasing trust in companies it's not really improving um, um, laws i mean it does some blaming and shaming but the blaming and shaming that's often done is for state-owned enterprises and they're very powerful and the problem is actually really internal fighting within powerful fractions within Beijing. The state-owned enterprises are powerful and they have their interest and they sometimes don't follow environmental regulations because mm. they can afford not to. Mm. Um, so this is the issue. Uh, but let's see. I mean, uh, maybe the social credit system will be rolled out. Um, I'm skeptical. <laughs> Christian. So, another question uh, about political institutions and processes. Um, what is the maximum horizon that the application of big data and AI in the political space is aiming at? So, what exactly is supposed to be optimized or even automated in the long run? Will even political functions or institutions be automated? Um. So, could you just repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, what is the maximum horizon that the application of big data and 
AI in the political space is aiming at. So what exactly is supposed to be optimized or even automated in the long run? Will even political functions or institutions be automated? Okay, um, complicated question. I mean, the way I see is in terms of political function institutions, I think an important function of this data is also, or at least the way how, um, it's um, China is branding it is also to fight corruption. So mm -hmm. it's about information asymmetry. So Beijing sometimes doesn't know what happens at the local level. But by having these centralized data systems where real-time data is directly uploaded to central servers, Beijing knows a lot more, and that makes Beijing again powerful. So it's about centralizing power in Beijing. And I think that, on the plus hand, it actually is harder to be corrupt. On the downside, it actually also, you sometimes now see that local officials don't do anything anymore because they are afraid of being caught doing something um, innovative because they're not sure and they feel, you know, Beijing's eyes anywhere, everywhere. Um, so there's also some uh, innovative stagnation because of this increased data collection um, that is increasingly centralized. This is something surveillance does all the time, though, right? You've seen that in uh, other uh, countries and systems that can be happening. That surveillance leads to stagnation and uh, just delegates um, power. Yeah. Christian. There's uh, one question about the question of innovation um, regarding private tech companies. Um, are there ways how private companies can push back on increased regulation or are we at the beginning of a new era with more private companies will be turned into state-owned enterprises? How would this influence innovation and investment? Yes, that's a, a very good question. Mm -hmm. And yes, we all would like to know and we will we, how the private companies now respond. I mean, I think there is a dependence. The government is dependent also on the private companies because the state-owned enterprises, in some areas, state-owned enterprises are leading the technical field, but in many others, it is the private companies who have who had the room to be very innovative, who were allowed to grow. I mean, many uh, other foreign tech companies were not allowed to enter China so that these domestic companies can become national champions. But now I think really this year is where, uh, and last year has been a shift. And I think it will, I think there's a lot of, must be a lot of nervousness about these private companies, how to, uh, I mean, I would call it a gradwanderung, yes, uh, like a very tight pass where you, on on the one side have to follow party objectives um, and the other side you have to be competitive globally and um, and I think both sides will have to enter conversation and I think this will be behind doors and negotiations and um, usually um, again also Beijing leaders are pragmatic so they I don't think they want to stifle them but they want to make sure not one company is too powerful they don't want many like alternative power centers. There can be only one power center, that is the Communist Party. And so I think they will make sure that not one private party, uh, company is getting too big. Maybe one last question uh, regarding that aspect um, asks, how does the pushback against private tech companies fit into Xi Jinping's future ambitions to stay in power long term? already mentioned that a bit. I, I think we all want to know uh, if and how this transition happens. We can't imagine. I mean, it was unimaginable that he actually already uh, changed the terms so that he can be as long as in power as possible. Mm. I mean, 2022 is supposed to be a change, but uh, it's very unclear if and how this happens. And yes, I think, um, uh, I think, He's, in my view, he's a very much, uh, he likes control. And he, uh, so it will be hard for him to let, uh, let have a polycentric system where private companies can flourish. Um, so I think there will be uh, continuously a bit of a stiff environment in China. I mean, we're all suffering of this, de uh, let's say, decoupling, academic decoupling, international decoupling. And I'm not too optimistic that this in the near next one or two years will change. Thank you, Christian. Thank you uh, for asking all those interesting questions. I'd just like to have a last round with you, Genia, to again uh, look at the 
really big picture now because uh, I think we see or, or when I listen to you to your talk to other talks I see a really fast development in Western uh, perception actually of what's happening in China and what's happening on the geopolitical stage of course we've talked a lot about you know uh, Chinese technology going into European networks like uh, Huawei and Gaia X in Europe and so forth about 5G technology and so forth so pretty much everybody is aware of the geopolitical technological race, right? We have the US where we have a very strong corp corporate power. We have the European model that is, you know, uh, regulating those big corporations or that's uh, at least that's what they want to do at uh, the European Union. And we have the state power model, so to speak, uh, very broadly speaking now on a geopolitical level. Now, I think that this... Um, after your talk, uh, after other things uh, we've all read, I think is sort of crumbling. Can we still uh, actually look at uh, such a? Can we still look at such a stable geopolitical model, or do we see a lot of things actually approaching each other? What we say about regulatory fantasies uh, of the EU, what we say about state power uh, in China, what we say about the role of private companies uh, that are talk tackled much harder in the US now, especially under the new administration than uh, you know they had been before. So those are really fast, new developments, so to speak. Is there a sort of um, assimilation almost of those three models? Are they getting are they still that easy to differentiate as they had been? I mean, I think there, there are still some, let's call them sp like um, special characteristics to each of these settings sure. you mentioned. I mean, I, I do think China cannot be a very citizen, democratic and transparent system like, mm -hmm. let's say, Europe is. And I think that is also where Europe has a special place. Um, not just in terms of regulation and mm -hmm. the GDPR and rules, um, but I think this uh, is differentiates Europe very much from China. Mm -hmm. But that said, I mean, I also think China is uh, um, increasing its game in terms of data protection. I mean, we I just mentioned these laws early in the talk. Oh. Um, so China is also moving a little bit into that direction. So yes, it's maybe not as clear cut, mm -hmm. but I do think the political systems are very different. And I think what really differentiates China and always will be, it doesn't have independent regulatory bodies like we have in the US or Europe. And so I think that makes it harder because I used to tell the students, well, you know, the digital technology has benefits and risks and you just need to manage the risks by regulating them. But in China, it's not so easy to just to say these kind of claims. I mean, who regulates in China? It's of course the party sure. state. And so there are fundamental political differences and I think they will continue and I think that will continue create also um, tension between the three models, even though we try to get global standards and global norms and maybe move closer together, but um, there are some fundamental differences. To be sure, one very last question again. Yeah, there's, um, you know, we've talked to many also American scholars uh, from the social sciences and the political sciences here and uh, at other events. And most of the Americans that uh, come to Europe say, oh yes, this is really something uh, we should work on the European way, would be something uh, the US should consider uh, in terms of regulation of the big corporations. Of course, the Europeans like that uh, when they think they are a model for others. And I'm just not really sure uh, how much, you know, self-perception, uh, foreign perception, and so forth. Is this uh, being discussed in China at all, the different models, what Europe is trying to do with big corporations and what the US is doing? Is this something that is that has a public sphere, so to speak, the role of Europe, or is this something that is just somewhere very far out? I mean, these models are discussed. I mean, also about, you know, uh, among academics and think tanks in sure. China. I mean, it's very, they very carefully, for example, studied the European GDPR rules and regulations yeah. and now also used some parts for their own yeah. um, legal um, settings. Um, it's a success story, the GDPR, so to speak, a global success story, you can say that. In, yes. So, some terms. So they're, they're taking some bit, um, but they always include some special Chinese characteristics. And I want to make this clear because when you look at the rules, they apply often them to private companies, but government bodies are a little bit exempted from these rules. Ah. 
And so then it's, again, it's not fully, you know, taking these rules, but adjusting it to the Chinese context. And so I think we have to be realistic what to expect and what not to expect. And uh, and I think the conversation will get continuously, it will be a hard conversation. Thank you for those very clear-cut words. At the end, Genia Koska, it was really nice talking to you. And uh, thank you for that excellent talk. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back with this event sometimes in the fall. I can't tell you exactly when. Maybe outside, maybe with some audiences actually in there. As you know, we cannot really predict these things anymore, but we're hoping for it. But I really enjoyed being here talking to you live. Thanks again. Genia Kostka. <laughs>